<clears throat> Some weeks ago, I was asked to talk to a class that deals with cultural agency and to address a series of questions that are valid enough to address them here again. One of the topics referred to the measurable effects in social change produced by the works of art one produces. I felt that the subject should be handled from two points of view, the one of the victim and the one of the victimizer. As a victim, I would say yes, I have witnessed those changes. However, as posed, the question seemed to come from a mixed platform because what it really asks is if products belonging to high culture are capable to achieve social changes that include producers and consumers of both high and low culture and achieving some effect. At one extreme, one has traditional paintings and similar objects, and on the other, one has what is called relational aesthetics or social practice in art. For the paintings extreme, basically represented by the idea that art is or should be autonomous, I have an example provided by the Guggenheim Museum. On my way to the little cafeteria on the third ring, I was forced to pass a small show of Kandinsky's abstractions. The paintings were preceded by a big wall sign bearing a quote of his. It had said, a true work of art speaks immediately to the spectator. The spectator should immediately respond to the work of art. This was Kandinsky's naive and wishful thinking 100 years ago, imbibed by his theosophical beliefs. It would be nice if art would be that self-contained and open at the same time, totally accessible and able to cross social and cultural lines. We all still dream with this utopia. However, this is not the case. Art requires not only shared tacit understandings, but also information in regard to references, and therefore is very classist. To have the quote repeated by a museum today without any warning or context, except for informing about Kandinsky having written it, can only be construed as an act of educational ignorance or as fraudulent advertising. But even if true, social change here would be very difficult to measure. In order to appreciate Kandinsky's work and any other work as well, the gut reaction that seems to be asked for as a key to access is basically useless. What we understand as high culture is learned culture, sometimes erudite culture, and usually elitist culture. So one question is if high art is actually capable of social impact. Not all high art is interested in having it, but some does and usually fails. The next question is if low art may have social impact. And the answer is that good products in what we as intellectual snobs classify as folklore may have a good impact in terms of protecting worthwhile traditions from corruptive progress. And the third one that may not belong here is what happens when something produced as high art is digested and regurgitated in low culture, like when Raphael's Swedish aesthetics inform Christian religious illustrations. Obvious social changes I've seen occurred primarily within low culture. And the examples can be pretty much summed up as visual indoctrination. Some of it is a product of a natural dynamic of settling on the lowest level. Some is artificially produced with advertising where because it's mercenary, it's difficult to neatly place it in a cultural class. Visual indoctrination is what for both the good and the bad is done with the production of kitsch, monuments, institutional architecture, religious art, 
bullfighting, military parades, opening ceremonies for the Olympics, commercial TV programs, and so on. In other words, anything that promotes acceptance and precludes the possibility of questioning or defiance may be included here. One could say that any controlled aesthetic, that is, any aesthetic with a mission, is or attempts to be indoctrinating. Sometimes, regardless the ethic of purpose, these products can be awe-inspiring. Military parades in general, but particularly those staged by Nazi Germany, North Korean mass displays, good bullfights, are some of the ethically offensive but aesthetically seductive examples. There is an aesthetic of evil, and the best achievements don't diminish the evil part. Many of these spectacles, symbolic pieces, and ritual choreographies are manipulations geared to brand a cause to the extent that we take values and habits for granted. We generally accept the looks of government buildings, banks, schools, and churches without challenge. We don't question the interests they are serving and just react with a, there is a bank. Mostly, we react to these things with liking and disliking, which has nothing to do with cognition, and rarely do we approach them with critical thinking. Most of the social impact of visual indoctrination is debasement. Aesthetics become increasingly simplistic, cater to the minimum effort, promote passive consumerism, and provide negative role models in TV sales. <clears throat> negative role models, excuse me. TV sales are underscored by exaggerated face expressions that in turn are accepted as natural ways of moving facial muscles. They transfer into daily behavior to then lead to ads that exaggerate expressions even more. We become a thoughtless and loud army of clowns and tell other cultures that these aesthetics are the norm. In that sense, it's the money that informs aesthetics and not the other way around. In Colombia, drug money created what is called narco-architecture, a local form of lavish tastelessness comparable to that of robber barons and oligarchs in other countries. It's an image of a new status similar to neo-Gothic architecture and not less affected, but that has social impact. Going more specifically into high art, let's talk about Picasso's Guernica, which is the most famous anti-war piece of the last 80 years and which aspired to have social impact. Its power is such that when Colin Powell addressed the members of the Security Council in the UN and waved his fake chemicals tube, they had to cover up the tapestry that reproduced Picasso's work. Undeniably, the painting is a respectable symbol. The narrative of disaster is clear, and the anecdotes told around it make for strong copy. Yet, Compared to Picasso's preparatory sketches or his etchings about Franco, the dream and lie of Franco, the Guernica pales into decoration. A couple of years ago, I went to the Reina Sofia Museum and decided to revisit the painting to dispel or confirm my prejudices. I went very close, maybe as close as two feet or 50 centimeters, 60 centimeters, to look at the details and the traces of artist's hand. And I enjoyed my solitary inspection. Once finished, I turned around to leave. Unexpectedly, a wall of people had lined up about six meters behind me. They were all holding up power shot cameras and smartphones to record the piece. The distance was determined by the wide angle settings of the lenses, so to fit the whole painting. At least to this group, the Guernica was not providing any insight, not even one where a postcard might have prolonged the experience. They needed to take their own photograph. They were not recording the Guernica 
but their having been there. The Garnica serves them as a cultural selfie and not as proof of political consciousness. It was sort of social impact, although not the one intended. I would extend my skepticism to political murals and much of public art in general. The classic Mexican murals talked about the evils of oppression and imperialism and proclaimed the liberation of the people. They were, however, presented in totalitarian and unavoidable settings. They sent mixed messages with their narrative and visuals fighting in an oxymoron. Richard Serra's tilted arc obstructed circulation to the point that the community had it removed. The art produced intrusive and unliberating spaces. In the Mexican case, the purpose was to impose a collective race and political awareness. In Serra's case, it was to express narcissism. In Picasso's case, the only example of these three that may claim a degree of success, it was a mixture of both thanks to lucky circumstances. As a practicing artist, I would class myself as a potential victimizer. This awareness makes me confront more ethical issues than I normally would like to. to th <clears throat> this is because I'm removing myself from a definition based on production. I'm placing myself into one of behavior instead. Once there, I have to consider how I fit in the distribution of power. What power do I have and what don't I have? What is the power I have acquired and how did I acquire it? What is the effect and consequences of what I do? If I only see myself as a producer, which is the image usually attached to contemporary artists, all these topics fall by the side. However, when discussing the possibility of social impact, we are introducing them into our task in changing the definition of the artist. It never ceases to amaze me that art schools don't have courses in ethics. Medical schools do because it's assumed that you need ethics once you intervene in somebody else's body. In art, conceived as a profession of makers, ethics wouldn't be important. But if art is a field of cognition, as I believe it is, we are intervening into the minds of people and their ethics are imperative. <clears throat> From an ethical point of view, I should be thinking twice about keeping or destroying what I make and about showing it to somebody else. Keeping or destroying is a basic ecological consideration. One should not pollute and art pollution is rampant. I have to accept that not everything I make is art only because I call myself an artist. Once I decide not only to keep it, but also to show it, I have to consider why I think it's necessary to show my work. I often compare artists to strippers, meaning that one should only perform that embarrassing act if it's needed and if one is sure that <coughs> there is something worth showing. This showing of oneself may be the product of self-therapy, of overly being full of oneself and needing to unload some, or of a sense of having to be missionary. Any motivation may include the other two factors, since no classification is as neat as it pretends to be. So I will underline the missionary part, which includes one's wish to improve society and therefore is hinged to an ideology that gives the mission a purpose. For Kandinsky, Mondrian, Boyce, and an amazing number of other artists in the 20th century, this ideology was based on theosophy and its anthroposophical derivation. For the Mexican muralists, it was an adaptation of Soviet Marxism to local conditions. For today, it seems to be relational aesthetics or social practice, mostly elicited by 
moderately progressive stance. In that sense, they all were and are artists that followed an ideological program. Kandinsky's quote was already misleading in 1916 because he expre expressed a belief in the autonomy of art while the conditions in which he created his work contradicted that. The formalist culture of the 20th century, however, bought the idea of autonomy uncritically. Clement Greenberg, for example, heavily criticized Kandinsky for not using the background correctly, ignoring every point that didn't fit Greenberg's formalist approach. Emil Nolde, on the other hand, is a classic example of an artist who honestly believed in the autonomy of art. An early endorser and member of the Nazi party who died in 1956 without ever apologizing for his politics, he nevertheless avoided political contamination in his work. It's a myth that good artists must be socially responsible and good people, regardless of personal mental problems. In fact, Daniel Richter, a contemporary German artist who discussed Nolde's anti-Semitism and allegiance to the Nazi regime, still concluded that, and I quote, it's a moralistic debate, a debate that mirrors the moralism and bigotry of a generation that seems to think that the world is a moral playground. The opposite position, that art should try to activate society through social practice, seems ethical, ethically more viable and is interesting as social service. Less clear is how much it's able to contribute artistically. The identifier of a work of art is an irreducible residue that remains after everything has been explained. It's from that residue that one takes off to continue exploring the unknown. Graham Harmon warns against two kinds of reductionism that fail to address this residue. Downwards reduction leads to what he's called sawdust, a reduction to particles subcomponents. Upwards reduction focuses on the effects, emphasizing context and connecting work to grand concepts. Both reductions presuppose, in Harmon's words, that everything is already all that it can be. The danger in this, again in Harmon's words, is that change would be impossible if all there is were nothing more than our relations with everything else. Art as advocacy is potentially an upward reduction, useful for helping society, but without necessarily advancing knowledge. For that, there needs to be an irreducible residue. Otherwise, the work becomes, in artistic terms, trivial. This might lead to the conclusion that it's advisable to keep art as an autonomous field, which brings us to a second topic, which is how aesthetic approaches may promote dialogue, collaboration, and indirectness as opposed to tradi traditional practices. At this point, I have to say that unlike Richter, I don't believe in the autonomy of art, but this belief reflects different parameters than those used to frame the question. Conventional belief places art in a disciplinary category that is parallel to other disciplines. This is a slight improvement over its previous place, where it was merely an enhanced level of craftsmanship. In the improvement, instead of skill differentiation, art was positioned as a non-discursive activity distinguishable from disciplines based on verbalizing. But this too isn't very satisfactory, for it continues to give the impression that the arts are a bunch of skills used for instrumentalization of ideas that cannot be verbalized. Since verbalization is only able to explain something exhaustively if it stays within strict parameters, Associating art with a different way of verbalizing doesn't seem very helpful. 
And in fact, contemporary art has blurred the borderlines between discursive and non-discursive. My reason for not liking autonomy in the art is dual. One of the reasons is ethical. The other relates to cognition. I believe that the mission of anybody living in a communal setting, family, neighborhood, city, country, or humanity, is to be a constructive member or a good citizen. What defines a good citizen is rather controversial, generates political parties, and plays out in polemics, and in theory also in elections. This consideration determines that whatever we do has to take into account the notion of the collective over self-interest, or at least sensibly and ethically negotiate the relation. Context and our relation with it become very important, putting us in Harman's upward direction. Traditional practices refers to the concentration of effort invested in creative fabrication and marketing, while non-traditional would therefore include a preoccupation about social consequences. But I don't see a meaningful difference in terms of the author's attitude towards the work. If I decide that I have to paint an angel's head on the head of a straight pin, I still have to judge it and exercise quality control through the viewer's eyes and needs. Second, I believe that art is a methodology for cognition that stands above all other methodologies and comprehends them. To provoke people, I often claim that science is a subcategory of art. While science is limited by certain rules devised from logic and repeatable experimentation, art uses all that as well, but is free to engage all the opposites and create its own rules. Art can use logic and be illogical. It can be both discursive and non-discursive, sometimes even simultaneously. It's the only area of cognition where the impossible is possible and where miracles may happen, precisely because they escape or transcend the explanation system of the natural sciences. If there is any plausible definition for art, it might be that it's a tool to isolate what is hitherto unexplainable and therefore helps to expand knowledge. When the justification of a miracle is sought through religion, it's an act of obscurantism because it's an abrogation of power and the relinquishment of responsibility. The miracle is accepted as a self-enclosed event, as something external to our possibility of cognition. By definition, this establishes the limits of our cognitive tools without challenging them. To that extent, <clears throat> religious certitude functions as a lazy cop-out. In art, in contrast, it's a challenge that is laid out. If art is primarily a form of cognition rather than a way of production that is art thinking over art making, there is no reason why this is not taught at the time schools are addressing literacy and logic. Art thinking would equip people to be comfortable exercising unbound speculation. At the same time, emphasis on art making puts art in line with other applied disciplines in which survival is negotiated competitively. So a full art education would also equip people to develop strategies for finding an intersection between imagination and functional survival. When students learn how to write, nobody expects them to aim at a Nobel Prize in literature. When students learn logic, nobody expects them to become a Descartes or a Bertrand Russell. However, when students learn art, they're only encouraged if there is a promise of gallery or museum recognition at the end of the line. The system is geared 
to identify and follow those believed to have talent and leave the untalented by the side. The process is consistent with the generalist notion that education is needed to build a meritocracy. This makes schools want to identify and refine the best instead of helping those who need betterment. As a consequence, those who need education the most are the ones who happen to be discarded the earliest. Meritocracy is needed to make the country more competitive. The official argumentation for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in education is about the country, any country, prevailing over the rest of the world. Ironically, every country uses the same argument. It also makes one wonder, if it's a country that needs this, why doesn't the country pay for education? Nobody would even think about making soldiers pay to go to war. The notion of competitive art making cements the division between producers and consumers. This is not simply an equivalent of sellers and buyers because it puts the general public in the position of contemplating objects. Contemplation, like any act of consumption, is a selfish act. To promote consumption, therefore, has ethical implications. It caters to short spans of attention, to ownership and high prices. It generates objects that end in themselves without generating knowledge. And it doesn't help much. When art appreciation is used, it's only to refine contemplation and to expand the attention span. Another question posed was if in a difficult moment, thinking like an artist may lead to unexpected methods and or success. On a superficial level, the answer, of course, is yes. But it's really impossible to talk about difficult moments. Difficult is a relative term, and although I recognize its existence, something only is difficult in relation to other things and situations that seem to be easy. <clears throat> I'd rather take them as they are, as problems to be solved. Thinking like an artist really means looking at everything as a problem that has to be either understood, reformulated, or searched for. By search for, I mean that sometimes we encounter a solution without knowing yet what problem it's supposed to solve. In what I called art thinking, a problem has infinite solutions, and the solution corresponds to infinite problems. In traditional education, the student is assigned problems most often following the scientific model. In the majority, these are problems with one single correct solution and infinite incorrect ones. This is in opposition to the art model where there are infinite right solutions. <clears throat> Working on a problem corresponding to design and not to art, the designer is looking for the best solution among many. This best solution is embedded in the conditions that outline the problem. It is there to be dug out. In art, on the other hand, one confronts infinity. The artist has complete freedom to determine parameters from which to start and to change them in any time, at any time in connection with the problem or to define a completely different problem. There is a permanent process of feedback and also what Brian Masumi calls feed forward. There is therefore total freedom to propose a solution that will work as long as it presents itself as self-evident for whatever one is looking for or for whatever one may find. This confrontation with infinity allows us to also analyze more restricted problems and to identify the limitations and errors. It places the imagination of possibilities as step one and the adjustment to the laws of reality as step two. Art is unique in this 
in its capacity to include nonlinear deduction processes and to posit problems in order to absorb solutions that already exist for other problems. This is not in the sense of biased confirmation, <clears throat> but as a version of reverse engineering that lacks a, lacks a given or fixed origin. In this context, the issue of failing better came up, a term that was coined by Samuel Beckett and that became a buzzword in the business world to signify that one shouldn't give up, but also use the failure to focus better and to improve, improve in the next try. I was trained as a printmaker and at some point focused on making, particularly on making etchings. Etchings are made by protecting a metal plate with an acid-resistant coating and then scratching the coating to bear the metal where the acid should etch. This doesn't always work the way one plants and accidents may happen. Like the coating lifting where one didn't want it, etching too long, or not scratching enough to go through the coating. With friends at the time, we came up with a mantra, there are no mistakes, there's only texture. At the time, half a century ago, this was a bittersweet way of consoling ourselves. But in fact, the phrase contained everything I just had said before about problems and solutions. There are no mistakes. There are only solutions to a different problem than the one we thought we were pursuing, which we then have to start looking for. Some people would call this damage control, but this way of putting it still is attached to the initial problem. I'm talking about an attaching our thought to the solution. I like the history of bubble wrap to illustrate the point. Alfred W. Fielding and Mark Chavance invented bubble wrap. The first name was air cap in the late 50s as a new decorative wallpaper. The project was a failure. They decided then to remarket it as insulation material for greenhouses. This was not only their second failure, but also one that left them with an enormous amount of worthless inventory. Before getting rid of it, they decided to make an offer to IBM. It could be used for them as packing material for their 1400 series computers in 1959. Nobody could predict then that it also would be used to addictive, addictively pop blisters. If we go back to the idea of infinity of problems and solutions, infinity for the bubble wrap equally equaled four, as long as popping blisters counts as one solved problem. <clears throat> one learns from one's mistakes, and there are many ways of doing that. But mistakes are connected with expectations, and that is where the danger might be located. Then other expectations may be ruled out instead of being explored, which is one way of giving up creativity. Art is difficult because no matter what one does, all the variables keep dancing in front of one, trying to push themselves into receiving more attention than the others. It's like being in a good but very unruly class. This brings us to discuss the valid validity of the variables, which belong to art and which don't. There are three possible roles for the arts in educational curricula. A, the traditional use of the arts as independent and self-enclosed disciplines. B, the integration of art views and production to enrich or help understand what happens in other disciplines. C, the dissolving of arts boundaries so that the methodologies of creation and art may affect all approaches to cognition. All three are important and have their particular function. The latter, however, establishes art on the level of a meta-discipline. 
This view makes me favor interdisciplinary approaches, although I don't see, see them as ideal. They still accept the fragmentation of knowledge, and the inter stands for hybrid disciplines and for looking at one discipline from the vantage point of another. While specialization has its uses, today we have emphasized it so much for the sake of meritocracy that the whole of education has become a training industry and what education really is about has been forgotten. I'm therefore in favor of transdisciplinary learning. This is a term first used by Piaget in 1970 and it refers to heightened stages of learning unmarked by restrictive disciplinary borders. <clears throat> disciplinary thinking is like thinking in one language. Interdisciplinary thinking, which usually refers to multidisciplinary, is like translating or thinking in multiple languages. Transdisciplinary thinking is equivalent to developing one single language that covers all of knowledge and looks for the right word or creates it. I think that art as a cognitive field is the closest we have to that language. Given how people are being educated, this generalist approach has minuses and pluses. The minuses are by focusing only from one single all-encompasses language like Esperanto was in its time, and a lot of knowledge generated by the thinking that informed the particular disciplinary languages may get lost. In the spoken arena, languages become extinct every day, and with them, the cultural body that connected and justified their existence also disappears. If art were the unifying language, we would be condemned to amateurism and incomplete superficiality. In transdisciplinary approaches, therefore, we have to be able to maintain the depths of disciplines while at the same time avoid the imprisonment of their borders. That is where art becomes not so much a language, but the administrator of connections that ensures osmosis. <clears throat> The STEM approach is highly disciplinary and assumes that by clustering a select group of disciplines, the country's ability to compete will be improved. Fearing the weakening of the humanities, and particularly of the arts, a movement appeared in the United States that, that promotes STEAM, the A standing for art. It started at the Rhode Island School of Design with the denunciation of the limitations of STEM. However, in the words of John Maeda, then president of the school, the STEAM movement is an opportunity for America to sustain its role as innovator of the world. National interests continued to be what mattered, rather than the betterment of individuals and collective culture. In other words, the arts in this view were also to improve national standing rather than to better people. This competitive angle already was an underlying ideology when C.P. Snow gave his famous lecture about the two cultures. He felt that the scientific illiteracy of the average British citizen was making Britain less competitive. He asked for scientists to take heed of the ease for broad communication typical for literary intellectuals. With competition removed, the theme was picked up more recently by David Scorton, the president of Cornell University, who in a blog of Scientific American also appealed to scientists to engage in the liberal arts. This time, the concern is to spin out and deepen the public's understanding of important scientific insights, particularly those related to issues that affect everyday life. 
Scorton is concerned with increasingly urgent and critical matters of immunization in climate change. And he attributes difficulties in scientific communication to cultural isolation. As a remedy, he recommends that in the grades from kindergarten to 12th grade, scientists and non-scientists as well should be educated in art, music, literature, history, and other humanities and social sciences to gain a greater understanding of the human condition. The responses to Scorton's appeal in the blog were mixed, but the negatives are noteworthy. Opposing bloggers coming from the sciences ruled out any collaboration between artists and scientists because, and I quote, they argue with you, refuse to accept criticism, say scientists are mental animals and drive you out of the collaboration. Science has nothing to do with liberal or conservative arts. It is apolitical. The author is urging us to dumb science down for the masses. We have tried to teach and find a middle ground, but time and again, it is obvious how so few people want to be taught. Finally, liberal arts are as relevant to the conduct of science as a latte and a scone. Both Snow in his time and Scorton today are concerned with an undeniable need for popularization. However, pedagogically speaking, popularization is a form of facilitating, of making the consumption of information more accessible. It has some functional advantages, but it's not really addressing education. Education's true mission is to develop autodidacticism. This means to enable what institutionally is referred to as the students to learn on their own. If this were to be implemented, students would not be buried in data, but would instead learn how to access data and how to establish connections. We're still in the 19th century mode of admiring the quantity of labor we invest in a product, as well as erudition or the quantity of information we manage to master. Meanwhile, Google's search engine prides itself of addressing several millions of references in a fragment of a second. Further, search engines and translation programs improve their efficiency each time they are used not because they expand their data bank, but because they refine their algorithms, their set of instructions on how to access the data bank. Even in the most extreme labor-oriented period, the strength of art making was based on the improvement derived from feedback, from listening to the work while it evolves until the moment it tells the author, okay, we're done now. Over time, and culminating with the rupture introduced by Marcel Duchamp with his ready-mates, we became increasingly aware that art is not about laboring, but about knowing. With his ready-mates, Duchamp started an art by designation as opposed to the art by making. <clears throat> he allowed all of us to become curators of the universe. He gave us the awareness and power of taxonomy. It is this power, one based on making connections, on challenging existing orders, on allowing us to seek new alternative and unknown orders, which makes art a subversive activity. It's interesting that subversion is always interpreted as a negative word. However, Subversion only means reaching the conclusion that the existing order is not applicable, that it is restrictive, or that it serves interests that are not ours. To oppose subversion is equivalent to opposing heresies, which means to oppose the exploration of the unknown and therefore to, expose, to oppose the expansion of knowledge. 
It means that mystery cannot be explored and has to remain mystery without the possibility of demystification. Or that dogma remains an expression of accumulated power and may not be challenged. Good art thinking should be the best medicine to cure these diseases. Thank you. Anyone opposed? <laughs>